Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief, the competition climbing podcast where you get a top and you get a top and you get a top. Yes, you guessed it. We're talking about the Salt Lake City World Cups uh, in Utah a couple weeks ago. We're a little bit late to creating this uh, episode, but we're, we're getting around to it and we've got the best people to talk about it. Of course, I'm Tyler Norton, joined as I always am by John Bergman, a contributing writer to Climbing and Climbing Business Journal as well as the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of Competition Climbing. And then our special guest, the man who was calling the action himself, of course, is Pete Woods, uh, joining us from somewhere, some random place in Alberta at the moment. Uh, but we couldn't be happier to have you. Uh, our memory's all foggy. Fortunately, Pete really lived it. Um, and I was thinking, John, interestingly, this is, I think, the first time we've recorded this where none of the people on the panel watched the event through the stream. So... <sighs> As much as that's going to be part of my discussion, it's kind of cool that this is the first one where everybody was actually there uh, sitting butts in chairs. That's kind of cool, right? It's a new uh, new, new feeling for us. Yeah, I, I watched a little bit. Of, I mean, I, I tried to watch kind of like the whole thing after the fact, like oh, not in one, not in one <laughs> sitting, but just, uh, you know, I mean, I had, I had a lot of airports to sit, <laughs> to sit in and stuff <laughs> to get back. So uh, I did manage to, it was cool revisiting it on the live stream after being there in person of course it's always a great experience to catch it live and i get the benefit slash the the part of the job that people don't know which is when the round is finished we edit together the highlights and then do the recap voiceover so you do the live and then you go sit in the trailer and you work you know with the the camera guys who edit together and then you sit and write the voiceover and then you do it so you like after you live it you read you're like i even forget I'm like i have to go back and like scroll back through the live you're like who, who topped that boulder and who won so yeah, yeah man. I, get to, I get it cemented in my mind right away you get the you get the reps in right away no that's mm -hmm. awesome speaking of reps it has been a while so we are going to run through the highlights of this event we're just going to hit all the scoreboards and the brackets uh starting off with weekend number one in the men's speed uh the favorite vedrick leonardo uh he loses his post-covid uh win streak uh, he fell in semis to Noah Bracci, uh, who won bronze against Ludovico Fasali. Kira Malkadabin finally takes his first gold in finals, uh, upsetting that streak that Leonardo uh, was beginning to build. Uh, in the women's speed, Alexandra Miroslav leads things, uh, beating her fellow pole, Alexandra Kaluczka. Natalia Kaluczka gets the bronze by beating Emma Hunt and secures the Polish podium sweep. In bouldering, after a nails-hard semifinal, Mejdi and Yoshiyuki lead the finals pack across the first two boulders, and then Mejdi took the lead with a gentle slab dino to a double mono and did not look back, winning his first gold medal and becoming the third youngest male bouldering gold medalist ever after Adam Andra and David Lama. Yoshiyuki Ogata comes second, and the young Rei Kawamata finishes an impressive third. Natalia Grossman took an early lead in the bouldering finals uh, on a difficult problem number one and never let off the gas. Miho, Brooke, and Jesse Pills battled for the leftovers, with Brooke eventually winning her first boulder silver medal ahead of Miho in third. While Jesse didn't earn a medal, her top of women's number one on her 11th attempt with only one second remaining was one of the weekend's most stunning moments. Let's speed forward to the second weekend. Uh, in week two, the speed records fell again in qualifiers. Both the current record holders trimmed their time once more. Kira Malkadabin cutting the men's record down to 5.05 and Alexandra Miroslaw laying down a 6.53. This week, Vedric Leonardo returned to the top of the podium and it was Kira Malkadabin's turn to fall, this time in the quarterfinals against Marcin Zensky. Tobias Plonger took second when Marcin false started in the semifinal and Ludovico Fasali improved one place from last week to bronze. Alexandra Kaluczka continues her win streak, taking gold when silver medalist Emma Hunt slipped off the wall in the final moves of the final race. Alexandra Kaluczka was demoted one place from last week, claiming the bronze from her sister in the small final. In bouldering, the session started off with the sad news that Tomoe Narasaki had to withdraw due to a positive COVID test, leaving everyone wondering who would possibly win the silver medal now that he was gone. That was tongue-in-cheek for anybody wondering. Uh, the women's final began with two boulders that were topped by all competitors, putting Natalia in the unusual position of fifth place after problem number two. 
The tension continued through problem number three, and Miho or Brooke were both poised to win on attempts, but Natalia closed the door by topping problem number four, which went unfinished by the rest of the competitors. Miho finished second and Brooke third. Futaba Ito eerily mirrored Jesse Pills' performance from the week before, coming fourth, but also getting a last second top on problem number one, totally lighting up the crowd in Utah. And the men's final was even more about tops, seeing a total 20 out of 24 possible tops and 10 flashes. Zhang Wanchan, Anjay Pehark, and Yoshiyuki Ogata both let, all led early, but Zhang Wan fell out of contention after missing a top on problem number three. Anjay and Yoshiyuki finished the round tied after topping all four boulders in five attempts each, and Yoshiyuki won a gold medal off a kind of disappointing uh, count back to semifinals. Kokoro Fuji took third. So now that everybody's caught up, uh, let's get into it. As always, this show breaks it down into the headlines, the big winners, and the big losers. And uh, as we've kind of made recent tradition, the guest gets to go first. So Pete, we want to know, what's your uh, headline from these two weekends in Salt Lake City? Uh, yeah, I appreciate the the, uh, the softball to go first. Um, it does help. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> like I said, get everybody you, you into it. You get one locked Loosen in. it up, yeah. Yeah. And I decided that I'm going to stick to my... One of my themes uh, as a broadcaster and as someone who's been involved in climbing for a long time, and my headline is, you don't know nearly as much about route setting as you think you do. Hmm. So I'm going to stir up a little controversy, I hope, um, because I don't mind stirring up a little controversy. I am, if you don't know, very pro route setter. I am 100% in the camp of the effort, the knowledge, the level of um kind of analytics that goes into root setting especially at a world cup level and then i have the interesting benefit of both being connected to the elite international community and uh people who watch because i do the broadcasts who are people that i know who are interested in climbing but they are not in like, buried in it all the time so i'm gonna come out and say that I heard a lot of people talking about how the root setting in Salt Lake City um, was soft. And they immediately make this jump that uh, male root setters just underestimate female competitors. I think that's a throwaway. I think that's lazy when it comes in terms of the way you analyze and watch a comp and look at what's going on is to say that, to just say, oh, they don't care. Root setters care. Um, the weather in Salt Lake City was ridiculous for one so they set when it was 30 plus degrees out and then it was nine during the final so friction goes through the roof that's one factor that you might not have considered out of dozens and when you look back if you think around is too easy because the best climbers in the world topped boulders if all six finalists top all four boulders I'm going to engage you in the conversation and say undercooked. However, that didn't happen. <laughs> didn't happen. That's a really high bar. I need all so 24 bar. tops. <laughs> so I think that's too easy. But if, if the, the double tops, the double four in the men's second weekend is okay. Maybe, maybe the men's final was a little bit light, but you had two, three of the best climbers in the world, top two boulders. So does that not just mean that two of the climbers climbed way beyond expectations? The root setters can't just set cranked up to a million and hope that they get one or two tops. So I'm going to counter that with a very interesting uh, local example in that we hosted a, uh, I've been out without a tour de block in Victoria two weeks ago, and I was at one at home this weekend. And in Victoria, the winner had one top. All the boulders except one got topped by different climbers, but the winner had one top. And in Calgary, the three of them topped three boulders and no one topped the last boulder. From the fans' perspective, it was ridiculously anticlimactic. Like, hey, oh, the comp is over. Six dudes just failed to get the zone on boulder number four. Thanks everyone, have a good night. My wife, who is a climbing fan because of what I do, thought the Salt Lake City comps were unbelievably entertaining. 
people topping boulders, the pressure of, oh, he sent it first try, so you have to send it first try. That's ridiculous. And I know that root setters know when they have separation in the semifinal that it's fine if people top boulders. It's fine to test lots of different skill sets, but they would rather see two guys top four boulders than six people top no boulders. And the line between them topping and not topping, as you guys know, I know you know after the years of comps you've watched, is one half a foot slip, one mental mistake. If, if John Munchon isn't topping a boulder, it's hard. Just because Mejdi flashed it and Yoshiyuki flashed it doesn't mean the boulder is easy. It means that they are climbing out of their mind. And then the same on the women's side. They are so good. And then you have two, three of the best climbers in the world, top two boulders and one boulder. I think the root setting was fine. That's fair. So, okay. So what do we say to the athletes who say, if some of the bowlers are too easy, that doesn't give me enough space to differentiate myself over a broad range of skill sets. Like I'm better than this climber, but you only gave me two boulders to actually be better than him. And you didn't highlight what I'm good at because you wasted two boulders with gimme problems that everybody flashed. Like there's gotta be some fair element of criticism there. Like they feel like they got shafted. And I, I think that that's when roots, when, Root setting is that tight, then some of the climbers will complain. For sure they will. Sean. As they did, yeah. Um, and they did, as they did. Yeah. Um, I think I heard someone say, uh, you know, when you have a youth B round, then it's not the same. So you take two boulders, you throw them away, or you have, I'll, I'll give you every now and then there's a giveaway zone that now means nothing. Mm -hmm. Or you've got a boulder where everyone flat in the semifinal, everyone flashes a boulder. Okay. But I also think that you should be able to, like from qualifiers to get into semis from qualifiers, you should have the top 10 do all five. I think that should be a thing that happens. And in the semi to get into the final, I think that it's okay to have three or four semifinalists do four boulders. And if you come out and it's the kind of round where you can't make a mistake, that's a different kind of pressure. So it's one thing to be like, oh my goodness, I got to manage attempts over four minutes. I might need six, I might need seven. There's a really high risk, low percentage move right at the beginning. Um, the crowd sort of love hates 11 tri boulders. You know, what if it, the last move is hard and it takes three minutes to climb the slab and I only get it two train Like there's so we could, we could probably spend two hours talking about the nuances of what makes good and like successful and unsuccessful root setting. And I give you successful and unsuccessful is different than good and bad or easy too easy. And if all the climbers climb ridiculously well, um, my good friend Tone Day used to say, we just put them in the boat and push them into the lake. What hmm. they do when they're there is on them. Okay, so my, my John, did you have something to say? Because otherwise I'm going to pipe in. No, please, I, 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 please, go ahead. So I guess the, what uh, I think there uh, there's, uh, a couple elements here. One is a lot of tops is good for the spectator experience, which I, I think is like broadly. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I think generally that's true. Um, the, the, it seems like you're opening the door for criticism of comps where there's very, very few tops, um, which we may experience at an upcoming comp in the future in Italy called Brixen, which maybe happened yesterday, was was an interesting example of kind of the flip side where some of the most exciting climbing was when barely anybody got tops. That's when it got spicy. Uh, and when actually the the um, the intensity and the excitement came up because uh, it was kind of like uh, all these little clutch scenarios of people improving and having to do it and hitting the clock and not managing to to get the send. So do you think it's, it's fair to criticize root setting more if there's fewer tops than if there's more tops? Like, do you, do you have more room for criticism on that end? I, and I, I honestly, I don't because all of those boulders get, and I get root setter beta and all of those things, but all of those boulders are doable mm -hmm. and it's either the moment or the mood or the climber, whoever it is. And people make mistakes all the time. So you, the margin for, if you want to call it error, and we might as well, cause we're talking about good versus bad, successful versus unsuccessful. The margin for error can be, you know, a half a millimeter and then they all top a boulder mm -hmm. because the move is this much closer or the, the hold is angled. One of the boulders in, um, if you look at the, the women's, oh my, I'm going to have to remember which round it was. I think it was the first weekend women's semifinal or women's final slab boulder that 
um, no one did the last move on, but everybody came agonizingly close to. Mm -hmm. If that hold is a half an inch lower or the foothold is like a millimeter better, they all do it. So now because it took some of them five tries and some of them six tries and some of them seven tries and some of them three tries, they all top the boulder. But if you if they all flash the boulder, that's one thing. You can be like, eh, maybe that's a giveaway boulder. If they all do it, now we're talking about attempts, and that could be climbers making mistakes. It could be the wrong shoes. It could be the temperature. And the same thing goes the other way. You can be a fraction of an inch away from no one doing a boulder. And I honestly think that if the boulders, if no one does them, you see Ruta just being like, why aren't you just doing the thing? Uh, you guys will remember the slab in the semifinal uh, at the second Salt Lake weekend last time, no one did it. And the Ruthans are like, just stand on your feet. The boulder's <laughs> like V6. It's V6. It's not hard. So that's climbers getting ahead of themselves. And when you get into paddle dinos and, you know, inside out rose moves and how much power have you got left after four rounds, if no one does the last boulder, maybe you're training. Maybe you gave too much too early. Maybe you had to try too hard in the semi. Maybe you didn't have a good night's sleep. Like, I think that you have to get into so much detail that I, I'm always open to have the conversation of like an undercooked or an overcooked boulder or two in a round or a weekend. But my, what I take offense with is people who just hammer away on the keyboard and be like, the root setting was too easy. It's like, you don't know. You, you don't even, you can't even sneak a peek into world-class root setting and understand me, what goes on. Let me, let me ask you one last question. And yeah. uh, is how do you like, give us some insight to how you think, root setters cope with that kind of criticism because after spending this much time in it first of all i think they're very good at shutting that criticism out and i think as root setters so long as you get the separation you go to bed happy like sometimes especially if you're a new root setter you go through waves of emotion and a lot of stress when stuff isn't going the way you hoped it would and i totally get that but do you think so long as you get a winner like a clear winner and a second and a third everybody's happy and, and i guess the second part is how much of that criticism carries over to your next comp? Because I do feel like in root setting, because you have frankly so little control over most of the factors, you don't stress over the idea of, oh, that last comp I set was not very well received. I better try harder the next time. Like, I, I feel like that's not actually something that root setters cope with because they understand how small a part they kind of play in the actual end scores or end show of these comps. And I, I think you're right. And the, for me, they, they deal with it by saying, and I've seen it, right? The, the expression is, did we get a winner? Did boulders get topped? I, we talked to them before. We talked to them when they're, when they're putting the boulders up. And, you know, you ask questions like, what do you expect? And they're like, yeah, we might see one or two tops. Everyone's going to top this one. It's just going to come down to tries because they expect people to slip on slab. And sometimes they don't. And everybody just dials it up perfectly, mm -hmm. right? You get that that women sort of walk across that ended up, it was designed as a, like a flag press. Yeah. The big, huge pink eggs. Yeah. I hated that problem. Then, <laughs> yeah. Because you sort of kind of <laughs> jump and hug, but as a root setter, you get people getting tired of parkour, which is a disservice to parkour. If you know anything about parkour, it's nowhere near as difficult as what those guys do. Um, so people don't like run and jump boulders, but you know, hands-free walk across the slab. I love it. Like a faith move where you've got to tip over. There was one of those in the semifinal that was just like, you had to let go and then you had to believe. Um, so I think that they're very good at, at doing what they want to do, which is create qualifying boulders that will get 20 climbers out of a hundred. Um, and sometimes they have to create 10 of those and then create semifinals boulders that go 20 down to six. And they don't care if they hurt some feelings uh, by people getting zero tops. And you look down at the bottom of the semifinals, zero tops from 20 of the best climbers in the world. Mm -hmm. So obviously the boulders are hard enough. Um, and they are, when they look down at that and they've watched all the rounds and they've watched the climbers and they do their tweaks and you watch them try a move seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times in a row uh, and move a foothold, a quarter inch, a quarter inch, take a blocker off, add a blocker, flip something over, be like, no smaller, too small, no bigger, too big. Um, so when you, when you're embedded in the process, you gain a different appreciation for what I think people think they build the, they put the boulders up on Tuesday and then they're just like, they cross their fingers. They put the finals boulders up and climb the snot out of them, finding the adjustments based on how people were climbing the round before. And then if they don't come out and throw down, you get the scenario where there's not a lot of tops. And if they back off things a little bit because they're like, well, everybody's climbing terribly. Let's, let's at least give the show where the fans are going to get a couple of tops. 
and all of a sudden everybody comes out and be like, all right, I guess we'll rock climb now. <laughs> then you have people flashing boulders. So they're very good at saying, my job is to separate the field and create entertainment for the people watching. And then they do that and they just sort of push out the criticism from everybody except their chief and their peers. And the chief and the peers is where they listen. Even I'm the, the um, not the jury president, but sort of the head of the judging group was there. Right. And he was talking to the chief and that I was like, I'm not even going to, it was like, why are you having a conversation about the borders? Like, you are not in this conversation. You don't, you don't have an opinion. You don't get an opinion. You know, so that happens. And then I think they just move on and say, I need to be creative. I can't set the same boulders I set last week. So what, what I learned from last week is that I need to do this, this, and this. And they actually don't, they don't actually set a lot of back-to-back -back weekends, right? So there's enough of a depth that we have to pull. So their next call might be a month later. Mm -hmm. So you have time to have perspective and say, I got new shapes, new angles, new climbers to deal with, and I'm going to do my job, you know, to the best of my ability. And I think back over 20 years of route setting comps and every now and then you think, okay, the whole crew missed the mark here, but it's so rare that that's why I take offense to people hammering away online or in person saying, wow, that was undercooked or overcooked. It's become um, kind of the cool thing to do is to think that you're a root setting expert at a World Cup level where you've got climbers who can actually climb V15, but the finals holders can't be much harder than V10. So how yeah, do man. you make them fall? How else are you gonna have fun on the internet than criticizing root setters, man? That's the that's the only thing we do, dude. That's that's why we watch Boulder and Cops. And as yeah. fans, you're allowed. But I just want to add, I wanna, I want people to be more educated in there. If you're gonna chirp, chirp educated and be like, Boulder three looks like it could have been, you know, different in this way. Don't just paint that big, easy to get out of jail brush and just say the root setting was too hard or too easy, and then not defend your position. Fair, fair point. Yeah. John, headline from the event. Oh man, I'm ready to go for like a three hour discussion on uh, root setting. We'll have to do yeah, a set, yeah, yeah, we'll do a we'll do a root setting roundtable uh, at some point. Yeah, I got a lot. I got a lot of stuff to say. Good stuff from Pete. I got a lot of kind of stuff to add on to that, but maybe we'll just have to, I guess, table that for now. Um, yeah, great stuff though. So my big headline would be let's go from the root setting to let's focus on some of the competitors specifically now. My big headline is Natalia Grossman solidifies her status as the biggest star of the 2022 season. Um, and I think however you want to parcel out like the elements of her season, it's all impressive. It's, it's all incredible. Like let's start with just by the numbers. Okay. So Tyler, you went through some of this at the beginning of this, this episode here, but Salt Lake city weekend, number one, five tops in qualification. So she's leading the way she ends up, she gets three tops in the semis and then she gets four tops in finals with, which is, I mean, aside from flashing everything in finals, uh, topping everything in finals is, is perfection or near perfection. Salt Lake city weekend. Number two, again, five tops in the qualification round, four of which were flashes. And I think the other one she did in like two attempts or something like that three tops in the semis and again four tops in the finals so near perfection there okay so incredible stats in that regard aside from the stats just the big number of she adds two more gold medals to her personal collection she she increases the the hardware in her trophy case and in doing so surpasses every other American woman in terms of gold medal count, aside from Lynn Hill, who she's she ties with at this Salt Lake City event or events, and Robin Herbisfield. So if you're an American, if you're in the women's division as an American, and it's you and Lynn Hill and Robin Herbisfield, whew, that's <laughs> that's pretty darn good company. Right? Rare, rarefied air. Yeah. Rarefied air. And then on top of that on a more narrative level, there was just a little bit of uh, something of a little bit of everything to her two weekends here in Salt Lake City, meaning Natalia Grossman's two weekends. There was certainly some dominance, but there was also a little bit of of tenacity because she was actually in she was in fourth place coming out of one of the semis. The second Salt Lake City World Cup, she was in that 
battle with Miho throughout the first few boulders, kind of kind of right down to the very end. So I think what is most impressive to me is that we are seeing Natalia this season so far being tested a little bit with pressure from Miho, for example. There was also pressure from Jesse Pills, right, at the at the first World Cup finals. Um, and and yet Natalia is still winning. And that, I think, is the quality of any champion that really interests me. It's not just the accomplishments. It's not just the accolades. It's the accomplishments when the pressure is is on. It's the accomplishments when everybody's coming after that throne. And I think that's what makes Natalia feel really like the megastar this this season. I, I'm going to add, I love that, and I'm going to add one point that came to mind immediately was that as soon as Yanya said, I'm not going to do the rest of the Boulder season, a bunch of people went, and Natalia's like, no, you're not. I'm, that's that's an interesting angle because for I'm very curious. Like John, you published an interview with Natalia recently, like a really good interview, where the issue of pressure comes up, which he had talked about in uh, in maybe it was an Instagram post or in a in a podium uh, uh, interview, and it seems like as like it seems like she realized that she's the one that's supposed to win all the comps now that Yanya's gone. But it does seem like it's also in her head that those expectations are weighing on her a lot. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about how she described that pressure and, and, uh, you know, it, it, it does seem to be coming from the fact that she's expected to win, right? Yeah, certainly. I don't, I, I don't want to speak for her, so I would encourage anybody to go and read the interview in full to get her exact words on this. But nice plug. She, she did say, <laughs> she did say, yeah, she puts a lot of pressure on herself. I, I asked her, do you feel pressure after after these wins and she said yeah but it, it all comes from me it all comes from within i think she definitely saw an opportunity she admitted as such when yanya walked away i i think natalia said she was a little disappointed too which was nice to hear knowing that natalia wants to she wants to face off against yanya she wants to go against the best um but that's just not happening right now meaning non yanya's not on the circuit there's still plenty of best climbers there out there um but yeah i do think natalia admits to start to feel more and more pressure as these events go on which frankly just makes these wins more and more incredible um and and we'll see how that what happens in brixen right there's a little plug for that competition (laughs) but uh i don't know how much i can put up like the how much i can fake that this is like a time travel recording (laughs) but yeah we'll see what happens in brixen we'll see what happens yeah yeah (laughs) well okay let uh, me let, let, let's pop far enough into the future that we're not actually faking it. Um, it, it Innsbruck, the rumor is, and she's on the start list, that Yanni Garnbrett will be back to compete, uh, not just in lead as we expected, but that she's going to do that Boulder World Cup, the final Boulder World Cup of the season. Mm-hmm. Just to clarify, because I think it's throwing some people. There is a Boulder and lead World Cup at the end of the year. I'm pretty sure that's classified as a combined event. I don't think it affects the bouldering ranking. I don't think it affects the lead ranking. Pretty sure it's a separate deal. Um, That's how it's showing up in like the ranking cards. So I think the boulder season ends with Innsbruck. So if Yanya shows up, do you think like where do you think Natalia's head's at for that? So she's won the, she's won the four World Cups that she's like supposed to. Sorry, she's won three of them and might win Brixen, um, but she's she's having the success that we expected her to, and that that pressure is there for. Now Yanya comes back. Do you think that's going to be almost a relief for Natalia, where she could say, "Oh, thank God, now I can finally lose if it." happens because who who's supposed like how do you expect to beat somebody like Yanya Garnbrett surely people haven't forgotten that Yanya is that good right like everybody must expect Yanya to win and the pressure is off me do you think that's how she feels about it like I'm sure she'd like to win but she kind of has a she it's it's not like the entire world is expecting her to now oh I don't know I mean she is the first to acknowledge that I mean she thinks Yanya is the best um or at least she did back in salt lake city last year when she when she beat her in 2021 she kind of said you know natalia uh, yanya's the best so boy i don't know i the thing that strikes me about natalia is she's a lot of the times i mean i've only talked to her a couple times but when i do talk to her i always get this sense that she is very in tune with 
the the joy of it all. If she's enjoying it, she'll do it. If not, she won't. That's that's also something she says whenever she's asked about, hey, are you going to go for the 2024 Olympics? It's it's always an answer that is somehow some form of like, eh, if I'm still loving climbing, if I'm still loving bouldering and loving lead, I'll do it. And so I kind of feel like we could extrapolate from that that it might be something similar heading into into Innsbruck. Like if she, if she's in a good place mentally and she's having fun with it and the pressure hasn't gotten too much, then she, she'd love to to go against Yanya. If not, I, I don't know. Um, but that's an interesting question, Tyler, for sure. I, I can't remember what the quote was, but there was, and this is pointless, but I'm looking for it in your article right now. Um, but there was a comment that Natalia made about Yanya and it, it was as it was kind of like in her mind. I, I can't remember exactly what the quote was, but something about it ticked over in my head. You know, we have this conversation about how do we how do we define and, and prove that Yanya is the greatest of all time if she is, in fact, the greatest female competitor of all time. And there was a quote in your piece with Natalia that kind of was so fascinating because it came from one of her prime competitors in this new era of her career. And Natalia made it seem like, oh, Yanya, she's inevitable. How am I supposed to compete with this? And it was one of the most interesting and and real like light bulb moments for me where I'm like, oh, that's a very interesting comment. If that's the effect that Yanya has on other athletes, that's an extremely rare thing um, to to just seem invincible. Um, so anyway, I, I would encourage people to read that interview. I thought that was amazing. And I'm very curious to see how Innsbruck goes. I think it's going to be a, a super interesting comp, especially if Yanya shows up. I, and I like it because... It, it brings to mind um, tennis dynasties to me. So I watched a lot of tennis. I watched a lot of cycling growing up. And team sport dynasties, sure, there's so many factors at play. But there's lots of individual dynasties where people are like, well, how on earth am I supposed to be, like, pick uh, a champion who was in the running for a decade at a time? Right? How am I supposed to beat Lendl? How am I supposed to beat Becker? How am I supposed to be like, I can't beat Nadal on clay. Like, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But people it happens it happens every now and then and i'm gonna i'm gonna tie in one piece because we, we don't talk about speed a lot like fair but one of our canadians is starting to make a name for himself ethan flynn pitcher and he made back-to-back -back semis and set his personal best and then broke the canadian record and then set another personal best so like his personal best is currently the canadian record he makes the he makes the final round and his first pairing is bedrick and he loses he climbs a very good, he races a very good race and he has a little, little slip in the last third. And I was chatting with him, watching qualifiers the next day. And I, uh, I called him over and I was like, you know, how did that go? And he's like, I'm pretty disappointed that my semi, like my, my semifinal ended after one race because I had to race, like, who's going to be Bedrick? And I was like, well, you are, why not you? Like, why not you? So he might slip. So all you have to do is show up and put your best effort down and then see how the chips fall. And I get the inevitability of that perennial champion, but the true competitors have this switch that's like, maybe, maybe you know, she, it, it's possible because it does happen. And we just haven't seen it happen with Yanya enough. You know, a little more time will be like, yeah, there's spaces in between where I might win, but you have to want to play the best to be the best. And I don't know why, if if you were Natalia, I don't know why you would think, why you would feel any sort of anything, but that you are, you would be, I, I think you, the favorite heading into a, a competition against Yanya, right? Because you have, have, have that recent comp experience. Yanya has not done a competition since April. And that, it, being rusty in that sense, in, in every regard, is, is a, it could be a real thing, right? So... Um, if, if I was Natalia or I head into that, that if, if indeed it is a Yanya versus Natalia type of thing at Innsbruck, I, I don't know who, who's the favorite going into that at this, but in the 2022 season alone, just like isolating this season, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's why we watch, right? That makes it exciting. Yeah. It's like, it's not, it's in our minds, it's not inevitable because you're like, Natalia has what it takes. So I'm going to piggyback right off this topic. This is a killer segue. Pete, you freaking nailed it into my, into my headline, which is that we're, we're in this very rare era of speed consistency, which is not something that I've ever really gotten a chance to experience, especially in the last few years. And it is 
very cool to actually be able to form storylines that are more than just about world records right now because mm. uh Vedrick is the favorite for winning speed world cups right now he had like the first time he fell was the first week of salt lake city we'd never seen that kind of thing before he was just winning golds every time he showed up and now this season alexandra miroslaw is doing the exact same thing and it is completely changing how we're able to talk about speed climbing and i hope it gets people kind of more into it because normally we don't get to talk like this normally it's a different winner every week somebody falls the favorite the favorite is really just a person who like won last week's speed comp but everybody like every Everybody has a chance. Whereas right now, for real, you've got actual favorites who have won a bunch of events in the last uh, in the last chunk of events, and you have a reason to call them a favorite. They are consistent, and they're always at the top, and they're winning those gold medals. And not just that, is we have these challengers as well, these consistent challengers in the men. Kiramal is always there and Kiramal and, and Vedrik, we treat them as a unit, right? They came up together. They often end up racing each other in finals. They've got this brotherly thing, but at the same time, they are opponents. And so there's this excellent dynamic between the two where Kiramal is setting all these records just as much as, uh, as Vedrik is, but he's still trying to get that gold. And in Salt Lake City, he finally did. And that made that so special. Um, and then, of course, he can't do it next week. And, and Vedrik gets right back to the top where we expect him to be. The same thing on the women's side is you've got that entire Polish crew. It's like six deep of incredible Polish speed women, but particularly the Kaluczka sisters. Um, and secondly to that is you have Emma Hunt, who's kind of this newcomer outsider who is also very consistently on the podium. Uh, it makes it actually fun to watch speed climbing because we feel like there is kind of a thread that we can follow from event to event, which is normally so non-existent. The one thing I want to point out, because it's going to happen at the next speed comp in Villar, which is, I guess, two, two, two or three comps away, is that Alexandra Miroslav has a chance to enter the very, very exclusive four wins in a row club. Um, only three people have ever done it before in speed climbing, and that's going back to 2001, Olena Riepko, in 2015, Chi Jong, and 2016, Marcin Zienski. So that's three people that have managed to string four events back to back and Alexandra can join that club uh in uh in just a few weeks time so that's my headline that speed is fucking awesome right now the one thing i want to put on it is that you know we've talked about this john especially in speed because these are the athlete it affects is the russia situation um the fact that uh, Russians are not taking part in uh, climbing events. And you can also say that the Ukrainian team is also heavily affected just by the, the incredible burden that having your home and your gym blown up and your country uh, uh, under attack, obviously, <laughs> it feels so flipped to say, but yeah, war takes a toll on training for, for sports. Um, and so something I've worried about is, okay, are these achievements that happen in this period going to be um, dismissed because the Russian team's not here or because the Ukrainians aren't as strong as they always are. And those are speed powerhouse countries. But it, honestly, it seems like people aren't really talking about this issue. There's no, you don't get a lot of, I can understand why it's not talked about on the broadcast. Like I get it. That's obviously not the IFSC style, but even just in regular conversation, you don't hear a lot of people talking about, well, where's uh, Yulia and where's Dimitri or, or, or whoever. Um, so I don't know if that's actually going to be as much of an asterisk as I think it will. I think that element will be forgotten. Um, I would say maybe it affects Alexandra more because we haven't seen Yiling Song either, and that's for a different reason. We haven't seen Eri Sasanti uh, Reheyu again. Uh, Anik Schober has retired. So maybe it'll affect her streak a little bit more because there are some competitors who aren't showing up for exterior reasons to the Russia conflict. Um, but either way, I'm loving this period of speed climbing and people got to enjoy it now because this is pretty much as good as it gets, in my opinion. Yeah, when you see world records getting beat like every other, like every second comp, um, and you know they've run better times than that in training, then it, you're excited because if you don't watch the qualities, you might miss a world record because in qualities, you have that, you have that one to throw. So yeah. they go all out and then they're like, all right, I'll just, then I'll just put down a sub five, five and it'll be fine. I'll make the semi, like, it'll be great. No problem. So that's when you see these records, they rarely get broken in, in the uh, finals on like, yeah. the, you know, round 16. And I will just, I think that your point about, will there be an asterisk? And I feel that if there was a bunch of inconsistent winners, 
um, then the asterisks would come into play and be like, what would have happened if some of the Russian athletes had been here? But I don't think that there's anybody as good as um, Alexandra and as good as the Indonesians. So I think they're dominating no matter what. And I feel that, you know, at this point, they're so much better that the the concern of oh but someone wasn't here someone wasn't there is yeah okay they might have they might have picked up a medal but they're not going to pick up a goal it's interesting tyler because i remember we asked a very similar question right after yanya announced that she would be gone for the remainder supposedly right we'll see but the remainder of the bouldering season we said oh is that going to are we going to have to throw an asterisk by whichever woman ends up winning these these competitions that yanya is not there I've kind of, I, I, the more that time goes on, I don't think so. Because I think in any division, whether we're talking about speed, whether we're talking about bouldering, if there's really, really exciting stuff happening each competition, um, no matter, you know, who isn't there, I think it, it, it gets kind of, um, who is there and, and the amazing things that are happening just kind of supersede who is not there. And um, obviously it's uh, unfortunate that it works out in any case that certain athletes aren't there, but I I don't know. I, I feel like in my old age here, as time has gone on this season, I kind of think less and less that asterisks will kind of appear figuratively as, as time looks back on this season. I don't know. The Yanya... wind aided hundred meter records, right? You're like, ah, it's fine, but the wind was blowing. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> the Yanya one is interesting to me though, because if she does show up to Innsbruck and just bookends the season with wins, I think that like sure. that that could be enough where you look at the scores and you're like, wait, who's that? Who's who's Janja Garnbrett? Like, who uh, <laughs> who's this person that you know? showed up you know so yeah we'll have to see but uh it's it's a very interesting question let's uh we've been mostly been hitting positive notes but let's hit to our uh big winners um pete we're going to start again with you who is uh who is the winner from this salt lake uh, stint i am i think i'm gonna my big winner i think is not going to be really obvious um because it's it's not enshrouded in like you know amazing like stars and explosions and fireworks and stuff but my big winner is going to be miho nanaka and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back a couple seasons to the fact that Miho was great at, in, in the era of Yanya, which is you know, a frustrating thing to do. Uh, and in 2018, she had all the silver medals. Yes. <laughs> seven so in a row, as, I think, or something? Like, yeah, yeah, seven in a row. Stupid, yeah. She's as good as anybody. Um, and, as, and that consistency is only matched by the person that took all the gold medals. And then she's hurt. So she's hurt in 2019. She's sort of still hurt in 20. And then 2020, 2021, we have all of COVID. And then she doesn't have a great start to 2022. And then she shows up in Salt Lake City on the podium. Mm -hmm. And then she shows up in Salt Lake City on weekend two on the podium and looking good, Mm -hmm. right? So either one of those weekends she could have had, right? There was room for her to take gold medals home. So I think... In, in my, and maybe I have a, a gentle bias because I'm a fan. Um, you know, I think that she's a one, I love her style of climbing. I love her approach. I love her attitude. Um, she's super engaging. She doesn't say no to people who, like, she gets mobbed. Um, you guys, I mean, this is great. You guys were there. So if you watch Miho leave, try and leave the athletes area, there are lots of fans saying, can you sign this? Can I, can I take a selfie with you? And she doesn't say no. So she's engaged. People like her. Um, she obviously loves climbing. So all of that maybe is, is adding a little bias to my opinion. But I think that this is maybe sort of signaling her getting back up to full power, saying, I'm very good at this sport. I had a couple of unlucky seasons where I wasn't 100 percent. I did have a shoulder injury. We had all of COVID and now I've got my legs back under me. And it's time for me to get back on this podium. And she did it, bam, bam, podium, podium, and did it looking very, very good. Her her flash of the last boulder um, took the roof off. It yeah. was like, that's, you need to, you need a top for a medal. Um, you might as well crush the boulder. I'm glad you mentioned her, Pete, because she has been someone that we've, talked about it pretty much every episode so far this season of, of these debriefs because we have really not known how to assess her right because she she didn't start as strong as maybe we had expected but then of course you don't know 
how much of that is maybe the post-Olympic fatigue that we have seen other athletes have, most notably Yanya Garnbrett. And so I think I said, I think the phrase I used at some point in one of our past episodes was I had Miho in kind of a holding pattern. And I was like, it's a wait and see. Let's just kind of like wait and see how she does before we fully assess her being either, you know, whatever phrase you want to use, like past or prime or or like it's it, it, it's so it's great that she just kind of erased all of that talk here at Salt Lake City back to top form. She is certainly a fan favorite. I think some of that has to do also she I don't I don't know if she I don't think she lives in the United States, so to speak, but she has spent a lot of time training here in the United States. I know that she's trained a lot at the training center with Team USA and stuff um, over like like you know, months prior and stuff. So I think she she's she likes the US. She likes being here and the people here like her she's and basically so that just team adds USA. Her. Like I know it's a meme, but she's like she's ba- the way people cheer for her, she's team USA. It's crazy. Yeah. Yep. So good one. Good one, Pete. Yeah, I'll just piggyback off off John, which is like I think I, I, I'm I don't remember, but I think in general I've been a little bit skeptical of okay, you know, you're you're like 25 this year and so that kind of puts you towards the later part of the average female career and you've which had is sh- ridiculous which is ridiculous i don't hey i don't i don't make up the numbers all right it's just mm-hmm. it's just well, reality right her her style of climbing though is is hard a pretty hard like physical hard on the body style too mm-hmm. right like so that adds to in, in terms of if you're talking like aging out or whatever mm-hmm. climbing style plays into that and she is she's a powerhouse and that's part of what makes her so fun to watch. But that's also part of where you kind of are like, man, the people that climb like that don't usually compete on the circuit till they're 35 or something. Right. Yeah. And I guess what I really wanted to get at though, was, you know, if you're going to come back kind of at this age after the years you've had, so a very difficult COVID year, Olympics year, injury year before that, right. If you're going to come back from a long time of like, man, and like, I I think the scene in, um, what was the name of that Olympic movie that kind of (laughs) disappointed? Well, the, uh, it was the documentary that Red Bull put out following Yanya Mi whatever we uh, oh, the wall the Climb wall for gold. sorry um uh i i think that showed a lot of just like how much of a struggle the last bunch of years had been for somebody like miho and if she's anything like me which i am nowhere near a top level athlete so i'm just talking <laughs> shit right now but That's if she's anything like me if i know yeah, like me. yeah 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 <laughs> um if uh if, if she has the same kind of human qualities of, of, you know, do I want to keep doing this thing that's been really painful for me for the last uh, a bunch of years, barring an Olympic silver medal, obviously fucking dope. Um, uh, or was it bronze? I can't even remember now. Anyway, uh, I think it's important that she's had success this year. And I think, I hope this is enough to get her really, really, really psyched. If she wasn't already, I hope this keeps her in it for a couple more years because she's one of the people that has, you know, uh, beaten Yanya Garnbrett. She, I think there's, I think there's a certain element where you climb against somebody when they're beatable. You kind of look at them differently than when you come up into this person who is unbeatable, right? Mm -hmm. You may see them through a different light. And so I think that has a really interesting dynamic. Miho is effectively the senior female gold medalist on the circuit i don't give a fuck about petra klingler i think she's awesome but she won two events and you can talk about them however you want but she is not in the form to be like up in the conversation right now miho is and so miho is kind of the dean of the women's bouldering scene and i think that has a really interesting weight to uh, to how she behaves in that in that category i think it makes for great stories too so i hope this is gassing her up to finish out the season strong um and then kick ass next year too i'm i'm psyched for mm-hmm. it yeah. Um, you know what? I'll just to shake things up. I'll do my winner just because I'm on a, on, we're on a Japanese streak. So I'm, I'm going to hop in here with Yoshiyuki Ogata. Um, and for, for me, what's what's interesting is that I, I it, it might not be completely fair, but if we want to talk rough equivalents, consistently being a male medalist in bouldering is pretty much equivalent to winning gold every comp as a woman in terms of like what's rare and what's possible for each gender consistently being on the podium is about as rare and impressive on uh, uh as winning gold in the women's field so what he's done this season is really really cool getting a medal every single comp leading the uh uh the uh bouldering ranking for the season and i think what's what's fun about it is he won the boulder season last year 
but it was off a tie break, right? Like him and Kokoro were tied for points. Um, so he's got the title in name, but it must have felt somewhat hollow, especially considering the field was a disaster last year. Tomoa was barely at any comps. Like it was, it was a jumble, right? It was the Olympic year. Everything was kind of whack. And that will have an asterisk, I think, in, in my opinion. The Olympic year was crazy. Um, so he's already got the, the, the World Cup championship from 2021, but this guy's about to lock up the one for 2022 as well. And winning those back-to-back -back is mad rare. The only person that's ever done it before is Killian Fischhuber, who is the top boulderer, I think, for men in history. And he's about to lock it down. He's looked so good when the other Japanese climbers are known for being really up and down. Kokora and Tomoa kind of all over the place. And I, I mean, once you're you know married, once you're a dad whatever they're still incredible boulderers and i don't look down on them but there's consistency issues yoshiyuki right now is beating the shit out of that issue he's looking awesome um for me right now he's kind of like the story of the year i'm super psyched on it i i, I will 100 percent agree with you he he is exciting like every time he comes out on the mat if you i mean people said about bo jackson like that if you in the bo jackson baseball era there's lots of times where people leave the dugout for lots and lots of reasons that you there's a, a market difference in that nobody leaves the dugout on either team every single time Bo Jackson stepped up to the plate. So if you were like, oh, I'm going to go get something from the food truck and people like, oh, Yoshiyuki's coming out and you're like, I'm going to wait. Yeah. Or because <laughs> for he is, his ability to do ridiculous things. Um, and I saw him. The first time I saw him climb up close was at a block shop open. So we came to Montreal and, and just absolutely destroyed boulders. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that boulder's not possible. Like you preview the boulders, like, no one's doing this boulder. And you're like, okay, this guy that looks like he weighs zero pounds, the way he throws his body around um, and his ability to bend his arms and jump and stick holds is, is through the roof. And I think you're right. I think he gets, he almost gets over. I, I mean, it's weird to think that he's, overshadowed in some way by like the Tomoa arc of, you know, be, but he, he just is yeah. showing up in podium and he's doing the work, but he doesn't have the cachet for some reason and he deserves it. hundred percent. I, th I think that that cachet might change after this year, uh, I, I, this season, it, it really feels like after this season, people might put him just alongside, alongside Tomoa in their mind, because I agree there is kind of this Tomoa, Cachet is a good word, mystique or something. I don't know. Um, How and do you it's expect to be a too. famous boulderer if you don't have a speed move named after you? Like, guys, <laughs> come on. That, that, the that standards have been books. set. You're in the books. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well said. But uh, so I don't know. Yeah, good one. That's a good choice, though, Tyler. Thumbs up. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, John, you're a winner. All right. My winner is, uh, I'm going to say Cheon So. Because. Ooh. I was thinking about this. It was not that long ago that she looked, I think out of her element is maybe not quite a fair <laughs> phrase, but certainly a little far behind the elites in, in the bouldering discipline. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't say that as an indictment on her. She was what, like 16, 17 years old and she was a lead yes. specialist. Like, how do you expect her to look in bouldering? Right. But you could tell that she just wasn't quite at that elite level. And, and that's Ill exemplified. I think she was 37th in bouldering at the World Championships in 2021. So uh, that's kind of where we thought she was, the 30s, the 40s, kind of around there. Um, but I think if we start to look back now, we can kind of see the promise that she had. And maybe we didn't realize it at the time. And, and here's what I mean. You think about the Olympics. It's this wonky combined discipline you can do well in it, as we saw, even if you're not elite elite at one of the disciplines, okay? But you can't do well in the combined, in the Olympics, if you're not at least wonderful at two of the disciplines. Well, we know that speed is not Cheyenne's specialty, okay? So she still, she manages to get to an Olympic final. Like, with it, that probably should have made us take, take notice of like, wow wait a minute, she's not a speed specialist. So that means she's bouldering and lead climbing like at the level of these other Olympians, many of whom are bouldering specialists. And fast forward then to, I think it was at uh, Meiringen this year, she gets 11th. And I think that we kind of 
overlooked that a little bit because it wasn't like on the cusp of a final, right? It's not like she was eighth or seventh. It's not like we could say, oh, she almost made it to the to the final. So I think we just kind of saw that and then maybe went on. And then here at Salt Lake City, at the the second weekend, she makes it to a she makes it to a final. All of a sudden, Che Yun So, like this ruler on the lead circuit, is also elite level at bouldering and that is super exciting for the rest of the season it's super exciting for coming boulder seasons certainly super exciting for the 2024 olympic qualification pathway just all that stuff so i don't see how you can come away from salt lake city and not just say oh chance so like that's a huge her performance is a huge story i love that and i'm gonna pull up my um the thing that Tyler loves the most, and that is my IFSC stats page. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, 12 lead comps in her career, 10 podiums. Mm-hmm. Seven gold, two silver, one bronze. And then you go to Boulder. <laughs> she's only been to nine Boulder comps, and she's taken a gold and a silver. So that ain't bad. She's, and she, you know, she's 18 years old. She's 18 years old. She had a... She didn't do, she did like two events a year. So she hasn't even done a full, she's never done a full Boulder season. Um, so give it, give it a minute. You know what I mean? That's, I think that's a really good call because it's sort of, you future proofed Che Yun Sao, especially as, um, as you say, the people who are going back to the normal combined, which is Boulder and lead you need to start cranking up both. And most of the good, the really good combined don't necessarily podium in both, but they're, they beat the people who only podium in one and come in 30th in the other. So that consistency, and she's been crushing. Like, and she climbed, like, I'm, if you go back and listen to the broadcast, Megan and I, like, she climbs boulders like a lead climber. Mm-hmm. And she only got undone by, like, super springy boulders. But she was like, she climbed every boulder, like, well, you can't fall because that's not what you do. Um, yeah, she was super exciting to watch. So that's a really, I love that pull that out even though you know she doesn't have a medal up from the event she kind of put notice out and and let's not forget too assuming she does go on to the 2024 olympic pathway how many she's she's going to have that 2020 she's going to have that olympic experience and you better believe that counts for something when all of these people who are going for it see what it's like to have this Olympic level of media attention, this Olympic level of publicity, this Olympic level of nervousness. Che Yun So's like, yeah, I've been here before. You know, like that, that's going to be a huge intangible asset uh, if she does decide to do the, the qualification pathway. And I think that you actually, you bring up a really good point that we could also probably spend an hour talking about, which is that I don't think that, I know that, I'm trying to have, see how far I need to back up this comment to qualify it. <laughs> I know that a lot of climbers that I know don't watch other sports, nor did they climb, nor did they participate in other sports. So they have a bit of a gap in their appreciation for things that are not climbing. When you consider the Olympics, people think, oh, I'm sure I, I might watch some of the Olympics. I have now spent some time around quite a few people in the U.S. climbing um, sort of office level and Kelly, who was basically brought in to take USA climbing into the Olympic era and his work with the athletes to coach them through the media, just the media was like days and weeks and months of effort. So you imagine the norm, the average climber climbs in a, let's say even a nationals or, you know, now world cup and you have a bad day and you don't podium, you just piss off, right? You go hang out with your friends. There's no requirement to do anything other than have a beer and have some people be like, yeah, man, Boulder three was some bullshit and you know, get them next time. You, you're not doing well in the Olympics. You still have to walk through the gauntlet of a bunch of media things. And then you have random stuff like, Nathaniel was offered, you know, you need to be on Good Morning America. And he was like, I need to watch my coworker, my coworkers, my teammates climbing. So you can't understate how your first Olympics, the pressure of the whole event takes away from your ability to perform. And I know a bunch of, not a bunch, I know quite a few um, 
people who competed at the Olympics in winter sports and their first Olympics is my, the, the village, everything that goes around with it is built to distract you from performing in the way that you know how to perform. Mm. So you are that level of appreciate that the Olympics love it or hate it. Climbing is in it now and learning how to walk through the circus allows you to focus differently when it comes time to actually compete. Yeah, I want to I want to have one last point just because like Cheyenne is, is obviously kind of at the beginning of her career. But what's interesting is I'm already thinking of her like in the footsteps of the lead queens. I'm, obviously, Jane Kim is an easy comparison, um, but the Angie Eiters and the people that just dominated that discipline like in completely unreasonable ways. And if you can tack a bouldering medal on top of that, that makes you extra special, right? Jane Kim managed to do it, but most of them didn't. Uh, and so if we're looking at a career that hopefully spans a bunch more years, um, if you get those lead medals and you can add on, like Yanya really sets an unreasonable standard for what it means to be a female competitor, obviously. So it's a huge deal if you are making finals uh, as a boulder when you're when your heart and your strength is in lead climbing that's why yanya is special so for for chayun to be in this territory and i mean i'm i'm probably a little bit more skeptical than john is but if this is where she's going with this stuff that's a really big deal if you were in a medal it doesn't have to be gold but if you were in a boulder medal as a lead specialist that is uh uh that makes you special on a really really long-term scale um for lead climbing so i think she's she's showing that she was more than just a flash in the pan that uh that she could be. Um, we'll see what happens this lead season. Uh, I, I yeah. don't. I, I don't think we could say she, if if somebody does earn a, a medal in a do, another discipline, I don't think we can say they're a specialist in one anymore. If you're if you're a lead specialist and you win a I, gold medal in bouldering, I think you're you, you no, gotta be I, considered. A, yeah, you know. maybe may, I, that might be a fair argument. But I think if you're I think if your medal count is uh, thirty over here and sure. one over here, I'm I'm gonna call you a lead specialist. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, it's like you said, Yanya is you know. Y any any competitors that are like Yanya, that's that's kind of a class all of their own. So yes, and it's funny to think about that. I remember getting perspective. Um, I randomly um, re met Killian and Anna Store in the red a bunch of years ago, just after they had retired and they were rock climbing, <laughs> which they're also very good at. Yes, <laughs> um, and um, we were just talking a bit about competition and the difference between being you know here they are climbing you know some of the hardest routes in the world, having come from being older world cup climbers and they he brought up sean mccall and said you know the ability to podium in lead and boulder in the same season is somehow underestimated because the training is fundamentally different so if you have the fitness to, to podium in lead world cups and you have the power and the mindset and the and the attack mode to podium in boulder world cups and you haven't taken a break and adjusted your training and be like oh i've won a bunch of boulders and now next season i'm going to climb lead because i'm good at both but to do them in the same year, the way the calendar is built is a, it's a long season and b the skill sets diverge enough that it's a big deal. Hmm. Very interesting. That's a, that's a yeah. question I have to cope with internally to, to like, again, talking about the Yanya question, I'm still like, it's been two years and I keep saying, I'm going to write my, I'm going to write my thoughts on, do I think Yanni is the greatest? And if she is, why? And a huge question I'm trying to mentally handle is what is the, uh, you know, what makes being good at two disciplines extra special? Um, and I think it's hard to quantify because somebody like Yanya almost makes it look so easy. Um, but that's definitely an area where I think we need to have more discussion about, uh, or at least I need to figure my my thoughts out. But yeah, let's uh, let's you move just on. Need to, to have a goat issue. You have it. You have it. Just have a a plastic weekly. Oh yeah, the goat. I'm gonna sure. have that issue. I'm gonna record that entire thing by myself. I'll just have myself <laughs> at all three windows, just yelling at myself about why I think. <laughs> you know, I'll figure out how to record that. But uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be brutal. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, biggest losers. Uh, and uh, Pete, we'll have you go first again. Um, I am gonna go a little outside of the box, um, but I again I think that might. It just raises a question that I feel could be raised. And I'm the biggest loser in Salt Lake City was anybody that wanted to watch um, like the whole event in person at an outdoor venue. Fair and play. there is a part of me that says, why are we still holding World Cups outside? And I, I'll put a few layers together. One is the weather, obviously. So a lot of 
climbing towns or mountain towns like there's there's an equivalent there um most of us in canada know that we had a world cup in canmore um, in the mountains <laughs> in the springtime and it snowed two and a half feet overnight and it was a disaster <laughs> i mean it was a great comp but um you yeah. know having it was ridiculous having people have to go buy plywood to cover up the snow and the mud you know all of that um so salt lake city the first speed day it was eight degrees during the day, but the sun was out. So we all had sunburns, but we were in like every layer of clothing we owned. Yeah. Um, so there's nowhere to hide. So the fans brought, you know, you bring a bit of a tent here, but there, but you're in the elements all day. There's one or two food trucks. There's a line of porta potties. There's nowhere to sit. You have to bring your own chair. If you bring your own chair, you can't see because you're so far back that the light changes from the blazing sunlight to the shade of the event. And you're like, okay, qualifications were great. I'm going to come back and watch finals. And it's seven degrees. And I'm standing still in seven degree weather for two and a half hours. Yeah. And then it, on the second weekend, it rained. It fucking poured. It was brutal, man. It was, it was yeah. brutal. So I feel really bad that the climbers get shafted by what would have been a thousand people immediately cut down to, man, I can't do it. I've been in the sun all day. I'm not going to go out and freeze to death in the rain. You know, peace. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to watch it from home or in my hotel room, whatever it is. So I get why we have outdoor venues. I get that you can put a lot of people in place. I get that there's lots of things around where would you put it? Off the top of my head, I can think of a hundred places that you could easily put a World Cup climbing comp. I don't want to get into all of that, but your average college gymnasium can handle both the size of a World Cup wall and all the people sitting in bleachers. So that's the thing that could happen. So I, I don't well, I think like know on, why on, we still do it. I think on average, what, like it's just it's cheaper to rent a piece of grass than it is to rent a building. Like I think that's the probably the biggest thing is that you know the scarcity of spaces that can can actually hold a wall. Um, uh, I, I take I take your point that there are buildings that can do it and there's facilities that have that stuff. But I think I. I it's expensive compared to a park. I don't know. That's one of the issues where like, I completely agree. And just to tack on the one thing that really caught my eye when we were watching, cause John and I, of course, were under the tent. So we saw the rain happen, uh, but we, we weren't affected by it. But so there's the big display, right? That houses the scoreboard and a video for anybody watching from far away. So it's a huge rig, right? Like there's the, the pipe rigging all the way up and a giant screen up in the air. And for both finals, they had to lower it to the ground because the wind was so bad that I guess it was becoming a safety issue or it might have broken, you know, part of the rigging or whatever. So yeah, it was, the weather was a mess. You're right about all of it. Like my body could not cope with, <laughs> with the, with the Salt Lake City weather. My lips were bleeding. I got, I, I've never had a nosebleed in my life and I got a nosebleed just from the air. Like I was just standing in line for food and just blood coming out of my face. It was crazy yeah. how dry and hot, but also cold and windy it was all at the same time. So I agree with that. I, I just feel like it's one of the few areas where it is just a like a, a money thing. If we could spend on it, yeah, there's places to, to host big events, but you got to be willing to pay for it. And I don't think anybody is, especially like USA Climbing, where I don't like, they know that this is charity. USA Climbing is kind of doing this for athlete development and out of the kindness of their heart. Like they're not making any money off this stuff. So yeah, it's uh it sucks, but I don't know how we could convince them to, to rent out a venue, frankly. And I think we're past the stage where we can just ask movement Boulder to host a, a lead world cup. I don't think we're in that territory anymore. But no, they, and they, it's hard to put it in a gym. It is hard yeah. to put it in a gym, in a climbing gym. <laughs> they did have a, uh... The U.S. bouldering, I don't know if it was boulder or lead, I can't remember, but the Nationals were at uh, the Salt Palace Convention Center there in Salt Lake just a few years ago, a couple years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So that is an option. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they circle back there at some point. I don't I don't. Yeah, I guess all I'd say is like... Anyway, all the CWA had to do was build a stage that was twice <laughs> the size and they could have had... I was going to say, that's CWA. the fucked up part is the CWA had a huge room with a boulder wall in it. EP builds a display wall and you're like, wow, this room is giant and it holds a ton of people. And we definitely could have just put the World Cup here and uh, added mm -hmm. insult to injury. And it had auto belays on it. So fuck everybody. Like what a what a kick in the pants. But anyway, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. So I just I feel that if you showed up to watch in person and people did that uh, you had to deal with a lot more than you should be asked to. Um, and even if, if you're my, if, I mean, yes, I maybe have one of the best seats in the house at times. Like we were shockingly close to, you know, 
both like the leftist side of the bouldering wall and I have, you know, the photos to prove it. But if you were out, you know, 40 people deep and you're five foot eight and you can't see the screen, you are just listening for how exciting things might be. Yeah. And I, I feel bad that there are other venues out there and look, look what happened in Korea. Postponement, suspension, we can't do it. If it had rained, the speed finals off. We just, we don't do it. Yeah. We do it the next day. So I, I love the idea of outdoor venues and I love the, the, the idea of, you know, we're all listening together and we're outdoor and you look up, you see, you know, the three sides of the valley that we're in, but put me in Brigham Young University's like D gym, like the volleyball <laughs> team's practice gym yeah. for that you could probably rent for a thousand bucks for the month because it's <laughs> off season and roll the bleachers down and put up a bouldering wall. Fair point. Yeah, and uh, just ex extra credit to the people who did stay through the rain. Um, it was uh, it was very cool that even after it was started pissing, the crowd was still loud as hell. Like that was a really, mm -hmm. I, I I was a bit yeah. It was, <laughs> I mean, I'm under a tent, so I don't have to worry about it. But I was like, oh, good for you guys. Good good, good for, for you. you. Yeah. And, yeah. Shout out to the person that brought Megan and I a blanket. Oh, that's awesome. Nice. Yes. Yeah. As they watched us shivering. Um, doing the broadcast and oh, Megan, no. I told her how cold it was. She came, she had a knee length down coat and I had every piece of clothing that I brought with me in my, in my, in my luggage. Yeah. And someone came over and was like, you look like you could use this. And we were shoulder to shoulder with a blanket around our legs doing the <laughs> final <laughs> broadcast on the second weekend. So if it sounds like we were very close together, we were. I bet. Yeah. 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 Good pick for loser. Uh, John, what, uh, uh, what do you got? So I think, I would say I'll, I'll do the preface that we often do, which is I don't think I don't think loser is the correct or operative word in this case, because it's certainly by no fault of these two people that I'm about to mention. Um, but in terms of maybe rather than loser, just the unfortunate and sad situation that befell both of these people. Sounds first like a of loser all, to me. But... First of all, Tomoa Narasaki, you mentioned this at the very top of this episode, but he... Oh, just what a you got to feel sorry for this guy uh, for how his two weekends played out. First of all, he narrowly misses making it into finals. He gets in the heart place, heartbreak position of seventh that first weekend. It basically all came down to that first slab, which was kind of like a it was I think it was Boulder one. And it was like a, a left hand, like kind of lunge. And you had to do a right toe hook at the same time. And I wrote down, Pete, you actually had a great call on the on the live stream, you said he's quote, he's having a nightmare to get established on this first move. He was like six attempts in at this point and he just couldn't stick it. Little did we know that that comment, you were really kind of, that was the harbinger of a nightmare couple weekends for Tomoa because then he ends up getting COVID and he ends up having to, he can't go home with the Japanese team. Of course, he has to isolate and stay in his hotel longer than expected into the, the next week when everybody's already left. It just, your heart just kind of breaks for the guy and how it played out that weekend. So he's one. Secondly, another, I guess, medical related situation would be Sean McCall separates his shoulder. And he said, going for a, a pretty standard, just kind of like a pretty basic move. Just so unfortunate, kind of extra unfortunate that he, he's presumably going for that 2024 Olympic qualification uh, as a goal. And of course, anytime you're over 28, 29, 30 injuries, is it's just like a big question mark in terms of recovery, added time to recover from this. He's certainly a fan favorite. So you, you hope that he'll be able to recover and, and it's not that bad, but just another heartbreak for this event. Yeah. And I, I feel you on Sean, you know, as you know, he's a, been a friend of mine for a long time and you're right. It was, it almost seemed when he told me what move he did it on, I, I, I watched the boulders and I, I was like, well, why is your right shoulder? Like it was the press and like sort of press and go. I was like, well, why, you know, it makes sense that you would have like popped out your plant, like the straight arm shoulder. And he basically rotated it out. And that I was like, I was like, I had a moment where I felt I was going to be ill. And he was just sort of like, yeah, he went out. And I asked for the medic and then I asked again and then I sat down or, you know, either stood up or walked closer. He was like, no, I need the medic. And they popped it back in and 
he just um, is, he does r really well to keep his spirits up, like out, because he is a fan favorite. But he was definitely a injury as you, all the whole arc of injury. But he was like, you know, he's been trying to spark the comeback since the COVID year. <laughs> Yeah, brutal, brutal. And I, I know there's a bunch more that had some injuries. I, I, I remember Johanna Farber was one of them and there was a couple others. So yeah, it was if it, it's like, I, I think if it was, if we had recorded this a week or two ago, I may have had more to say about the injuries, but a lot of it has faded into the distance. Um, but yeah, it really unfortunate. The two that you pick out are, are, are great ones. Um, yeah, the Tamal one, brutal. Like for, for people that weren't there, like the, the CWA conference, which was at the same time as the first world cup. And so there's a lot of crossover, um, a ton of COVID going around. Like every, it feels like everybody got COVID coming out of that conference. So it did feel a little bit inevitable once we started getting those first texts from people being like, Oh, I tested positive. It was like, Oh no. And, uh, unfortunately it had to be him. So, uh, glad it wasn't more, but, but yeah, brutal, uh, brutal ending. Uh, yeah, my my loser, uh, and then we'll do quick uh, one minute um, honorable mentions for for whatever you guys want before we wrap it. Uh, my loser is just like I don't know what the fuck is going on with the broadcast deal in Europe, but the stuff on Instagram and Pete, you get to you get a buy from taking part in this conversation if, if you don't want to. <laughs> totally cool with that. Um, it like it takes a lot to get Sean McCall and Shauna Coxie to go on the internet and basically i should talk tonight the right word but offer heavy criticism of something that the ifsc uh, has done they're they're they are insiders right they're not people that throw stones from the outside they are in the organization they are presidents or former presidents of the athletes commission like they are fix it from the inside people so criticism from people like that is heavy stuff um you're having broadcasts where there's all of like territories where there was commentary in the past all of a sudden there is no commentary you are having issues where all of a sudden the stream is on youtube for people in countries that are supposed to be geo-blocked i'm i'm at a loss for like i i guess the the like who's letting who down is eurosport shit at this and the ifsc has there's nothing they can do about it or they're giving them a chance is the ifsc blocking stuff uh through geoblock like whenever they remember or whenever they feel like it like i really don't know what's going on it's stupid and i know they can fix most of this stuff but it's really hard to take seriously that anybody is that there's anybody responsible behind the scenes right like i don't know how there's so much inconsistency from event to event and that is the big thing is the inconsistency i can totally expect that somebody in this chain from the ifsc to eurosport i can guess that somebody might be incompetent that happens like i get it it's not cool but i get it but to see it change from event to event for no reason and with very little warning and if there is warning it's an instagram story like five minutes before or people on the internet are like yo does anybody notice but the semifinals is like open we can watch it and we're in you know france or whatever i don't really understand what's going on and what's worse is the ifsc isn't saying anything about it so my big deal is where's the consistency and with all this shit happening and your own like internal members of your organization complaining about it somebody's got to say something at some point because right now you're charging more for something that is demonstrably worse than it has been in the past and so i don't know what's going on but it is super depressing i'm not generally against charging people to watch a good product i can i understand why i get it but i really cannot like i'd love to get on side and support this stuff if we were making money and improving the sport but i don't see improvements and the broadcast is worse so tell me what I'm missing. That's kind of where I'm at. I don't expect anybody to answer those questions, but I'm super frustrated after those Salt Lake uh, events. Let, let me take a high level swing at it. Um, and what I will say is that I, I appreciate that your angle is that not, we shouldn't be making progress is that if we're going to make progress, it better be good. And it should be I anything. Will, like, I don't see the progress aside from selling the rights. That's my issue. Yeah. And I, and I feel that. And, I'm, uh, I have to walk, a, as you say, a, a relatively um, skinny line being employed on the broadcast for the IFSC. But so I know a bit about what goes on in the background. And I know, you know, we hear people text me, right? They're like, did you know that this? And I was <laughs> texting with Shauna Coxie, right? She was like, 
you know, how come we don't have this? And I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I get that. I'm, a, I, I, I love that you get it. You're like just staring at a single camera. Like, it's not my fucking job. I can't do anything yeah. about it, but yeah. Can't. It's awesome. not like I forgot to push a button yeah. like, on, yeah, the, yeah, on the yeah. mixer, right? Like, yeah. Oh shit. Eurosport. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so I, <laughs> There's I a big button that just says Eurosport. <laughs> You're like, God damn it. We didn't push the Eurosport button. You're like, Dan, did you push the Eurosport button? I didn't know it pushed the Eurosport button. Like that's not what happens. Yeah. Um, right. So I, I appreciate that your approach isn't that we should only be streaming free on YouTube because I think the future of like every single sport you watch um, is you have cable to watch it. So if you're an adult and you have TV and you want to watch live sports, you buy the channels that give you the live sports you want to watch. If you're a basketball fan, you make sure that you have Sports Center. You know, if you want ESPN, if you want whatever it is, if you want to watch you know, Italian Premier League football, then you better get La Liga, right? You get a, you get a, you subscribe to the channel that gives you the sport you want to watch in the country that you live in. And I think that climbing is ready to do that. But I'm, I agree with you. The product has to be good. And we didn't know the Eurosport was inconsistent in either they put their own commentary on and it's not great. Or so we said, I remember we were like, well, just pick up, just take our feed. Why aren't they just taking our commentary feed? And then they had a final, they had a semifinal with no commentary at all. So we're like, why wouldn't they? Like, this is a solvable problem. So you're right. There is, there are mistakes in the chain. And I don't know if it's because the deal came through really late in the year, but the IFSC has had broadcast rights in Europe for years. Mm -hmm. You know, like 40 channels pick up the World Cup. Yeah. So definitely people pick up the feed. Some of them do um, um, closed captioning. Some of them do translations. There's all those things. We pause for commercials for Eurosports. So like you stop, you wait, we either show something or we go back to just filling and, and then we pause and, just and to, come back again. So all of that exists. And to add to your point really quickly is like the IFSC has worked with broadcast companies to the point where they've had external broadcast companies film and shoot the entire event, right? Like they've, mm -hmm. they've had that experience. So it's not entirely new working with other people. Mm -hmm. So we're basically saying we're, we're taking, I think they share a satellite feed basically. And we, we Eurosport says, Hey, these are our commercial breaks. Um, and it's in our run sheet that says at, at this point in the final, we need to be completely silent for three seconds so that we can cut and do our commercial and you can do whatever you want on your live stream but then you have to be completely silent at this moment so that we can bring, we can come back. So if you watch the finals, you'll be like, well, this is a weird moment to not be watching rock climbing. Um, that's because Eurosport is showing two, two minutes and 30 seconds of commercials. Right. So all of that is dialed in. They just haven't decided what to do with the commentary. And that's a huge, and I agree that that's a huge issue because that's, you know, it's a pretty critical part of, of a broadcast is to have someone telling you, what's going on and, and doing the things that we try and do and bring the broadcast. So we don't have, we're being like, here's the feed. <laughs> we're doing our job and something is happening on the other side of the Eurosport barrier. So I, it's not the IFSC broadcast crew who's, who's saying, Oh, you know, we didn't do this or didn't plug the right cord in something. Someone in Eurosport is deciding and you're right. The inconsistency is bizarre. And then I saw a post from Sean and me like, Hey, you know, we heard uh, Matt and and, uh, and Dan on the on the finals broadcast. You know, that's a huge improvement. But when we were going back and forth, she was like, "If it's not there, it's bad." Previously, it was terrible. You guys are great. Why aren't we listening to Pete and Megan? Yeah, no, I, I uh, that and like you know the, I, I guess the the two things aside from what you've addressed, so. I don't understand why some stuff is geo blocked and why it's not. I feel like if you own the broadcast rights, that's something that you take really seriously. If you paid money to own the rights to something, why is it that you're now giving it up or or the people you bought it off of are just willing to make it free against a contract? I don't know. I haven't seen the contract, but that's super confusing. Um, I don't really know what the deal is there. But lastly, the easiest win for the IFSC, if the issues are on Eurosport, is to take the role of the advocate for climbers and for our industry and say, this agreement isn't being, uh, uh, isn't, what am I trying to say? Uh, our partners aren't living up to their promise of presenting our sport in a great way, right? So if it is all in Eurosport, I understand that they have a business relationship with them, but at some point you have to say, we hear your concerns, 
our entire community. Here's what we're trying to do to fix it. But in typical IFSC faction, fashion they just kind of like give up on the easy wins or maybe it is partly to do with the fact that maybe there is something shitty or fishy or or not particularly professional about the agreement i don't know again you don't have to comment on that i don't want to make you i don't want to get you to a point where you have to do the eddie falk disclaimer every time you go on record and he's got his like pre-written thing that he says every single time i don't i don't want you to get to that point but yeah those are so i, I think your point is great i don't think a lot i have all my own criticisms on an ifsc broadcast that's a whole nother thing we've talked about about that but for this particular issue it is somewhere in that relationship um, between the ifsc and eurosport so i just don't get it um, we'll see how things progress over the rest of the year hopefully they find some consistency hopefully the quality is up um that spoiler there was some very cool stuff at brixen that was really neat um that and, and actually, some of it goes back to Salt Lake as well from the IFSC broadcast people, some new shoulder content, filling in some of those gaps and making extra content that was really cool. So that's great. Um, but there's something about the this- magazine show, right? That, I don't know if you've seen if that if it's been released yet, but they're doing a monthly um, sort of connection between all of the events oh, with cool. a little bit of extra content. So there's an IFSC magazine show that's going to come out. And I thought the first one was was maybe ready to go, but we filmed a little behind the scenes on the speed wall, a little bit of like, here's what it, you know, here's here's what's going on, you know, at a venue like this. So we there is some of this extra content going on to make it you know, to connect the people that are you know following IFSC through their all of their media in that way. And then as you say, you know, we did a few more um, Instagram live. We did an Instagram live before the para climbing. Yeah. Um, uh, in between paraclimbing events, we did a thing before speed. We did a few things here and there. We were, yeah. we were supposed to go live after the finals, but it was se seven degrees. And Marco sure. was like, I, I was texting him, I'm like, yeah. are we doing the thing? He was like, yeah. I'm already in the hotel. Like, yeah. No. yeah, I saw them I saw them do the live in Meiringen and it was it was kind of I, I, I hate Instagram live videos personally. To me, I don't enjoy watching video in that platform, but that's just me. Um, but it was cool getting to walk around, feel the vibe, talk to the climbers when they're in kind of a different headspace, right? Everybody's kind of in an after comp, almost an after party vibe, not quite there, um, but close. And uh, yeah, that was cool. I, I dig that they're trying new stuff and uh, yeah. So John C spearheaded it. You, uh, you did that impromptu uh, tour around the facility with Pete and that's all it took. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. You get to yeah, take all the credit for that. <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. But I'm just stoked that, that I, I'm all for more video content. I think I tweeted something about it, how it this fuels the fandom, right? Because people that get really into these comps, really into climbing, they're going to immediately want to go down rabbit holes and and find more videos related to whether it's like a magazine type of show, like you're mentioning, Pete, whether it's a tour of the venue, whether it's a, uh, a like what's in Quinn Mason's bag type of thing. Um, so you like that? <laughs> I, I do not. I, I could give a shit about what's in people's no, bag. I, I don't know. Cool. To me, if that's like, in, so, okay, they, actually, I, I, this cannot become the topic we're talking about, but I would say I'd be down for that kind of stuff at the start of a comp, but after somebody has won and we're lining up for a podium, I would really love some like post comp analysis or something. I don't want to see Emil Abramson, if that's his last name. I know he's a very popular YouTuber and that is a cool thing on its own. I don't need to know what's in his bag. I don't, he's a shit comp climber. I don't give a fuck. Um, but yeah, at, at, at that particular- Would you wanna, would you wanna see me trying a, a qualifying boulder? Getting uh, advice from uh, one of the root setters? Not before a podium, but any other time I would laugh my ass off. Yeah, for sure. I just yeah, want something- That's gonna come out on the magazine show. That's, that's awesome. on the magazine show. That's yeah, it. that's that's me getting talked up of a, 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 a women's quality boulder let's be sure that i didn't try and jump on a men's quality boulder. um <laughs> with uh with olgo with one of the root setters from the second week that's so it man yeah that's I, the kind of stuff we're trying to do to be clever and say hey how can we yeah. connect on a social level that's a little bit deeper i think that's wicked yeah just i yeah. ideally not not when not right before a podium to me there's yeah. a different level of gravitas you got to fill that gap with and it's not what meme about hey i've got a fan in my bag look whoa mary like that's just not my that's just not my vibe at that time in a broadcast anyway that's uh uh that's that. we all did our losers right yeah we're done okay so uh because i know everybody's always got an extra one this is your uh this is your honorable mention and you're capped at 60 seconds for what it's going to be so would anybody like to uh to make a you don't have to 
people don't like long videos on YouTube. So if we just cut it here, it's better. But if anybody has an honorable mention, now's the time. John, you got anything stirring in your brain? Sure, I'll, I'll make it real quick here. Honorable mention, since I started talking about Natalia, I'll end talking about a couple of other Americans. Quick shout out to Emma Hunt, who is also in the midst of just a really fantastic season. I think you did a good job, Tyler, of explaining why the speed is really exciting right now. I think in the women's division, Emma's in that mix too, certainly from an American perspective, just kind of rolling through these American records. It's like every time she sets one, then the next comp, she seems to reset the American record. And also, we didn't really talk about Brooke Rabatou, but I think there's a lot to be said about her. She is in the midst of her best bouldering season ever. She and Natalia in particular just always seem to have kind of this magic coupling in Salt Lake City now, putting last year with this year. They they it just seems to bring out the best in both of them. And so uh so Brooke, another another American star having a great year. Brooke could easily become a a uh, runner up to the uh Melissa Lenev like best climber to never win a gold medal if uh if she keeps it it was great that she upgraded to silver that was sick but you you look at her and you're like man with the cohort that you're in like getting that gold is going to be tough and i'm sure she can do it but considering the the closet that she's racked up so far and still doesn't have that gold i'm very interested to see how her story plays out pete do you have any uh any uh, uh runners up honorable mentions i do I, i'm gonna try and stack three of them together very quickly uh, right. one of them is sort of the the, the growth of maybe some uh, some of the it, the teams internationally. So you see, we're we're always so focused on like one climber here, one climber there, and we get we get tipped into the the Japanese team because they've been dominating. But you look at some of the old young pairings. There's some teams that are starting to get it right where the, obviously things are rubbing off um, down the line. So you look at the Austrians, you look at the Slovenians, you look at the Koreans. There's multiple successful athletes in those federations that are showing that there it's not one athlete and then a gap for you know five seasons till the next one comes along so there's sort of on mass there's that growth and the canadians are there so we sent a full squad to salt lake city we had first time semi-finalists in Guy McNamee who showed that he has what it takes um and was you know not very far from making the semi on the second weekend. So we climbed very, very well. Alana got back into a semifinal climbing very well. And a couple of our young first time national team members, um, Babette Roy climbed very well. She was, you know, disappointed to not get into a semi, but top three boulders. So, you know, we, we got promise and I like, I like promise and especially, you know, from our Canadians and I'm going to take that into paraclimbing. And I know that's not part of the debrief, but there was a paraclimbing world cup in between. So we did have, uh, five world cups in the space of 10 days and we had tuesday wednesday paraclimbing and we sent a full canadian team to the paraclimbing world cup we had uh, 91 climbers we had 100 originally but because of the classification system some of them didn't compete from 19 countries and we had a really really successful paraclimbing world cup at the front and we had a full canadian team for the first time ever at a paraclimbing event and that is growth um, and I think it's something that it's important that people remember that when you're supporting your Canadian climbers, that there is a paraclimbing team out there and they are trying to get the paraclimbing World Cups. And if you've never watched a paraclimbing World Cup, you should. It's uh, it's as exciting as any other event that we put out. That's a, yeah, it's a great call. I would have loved for that to be my first paraclimbing World Cup to watch, but for personal reasons, it didn't work out. But uh, yeah, and uh, I think my runner up, uh, it was going to be my biggest loser for a second was going to be the Slovenian women's team um, when Jan is not around. Uh, but I think I'm going to make my runner up a huge pander and that's going to be, it was really fun. Uh, like my headline, it was really fun to be at a world cup again. Like it's been a long time. Uh, it was great to see I, I, for people that don't know, I've never met John before until we went to Salt Lake and I didn't think he was going to be there. And then he texted me one night and, uh, and he actually came down and that was really cool. Um, it was nice to meet somebody I've been friends with for a long time. It was great to see Pete in action you know, we've, we've actually, yeah, we've commentated a comp before. I'm remembering mm -hmm. that. up, the, Yeah. Um, but it was great to see you do it on this high level. That's a huge deal. And I think it's so cool that we get to have a Canadian doing it at, on the world stage. That's dope. 
um, that's a big deal for us. It's a huge in. It's a connection for all the Canadian athletes and people involved that they've got a link now. That's wicked. Um, and it was also nice to meet a bunch of the people that watch this show. So if you were there and we got to say hi, that was really cool. So it was nice to meet everybody. Um, and on that note, I think we're going to wrap this thing. That's been another episode of The Debrief. If you like this kind of content, make sure you like the episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. You can join our Discord server. That's where we talk about comps as they happen and other gym-related stuff. It's a great community in there. Lots of funny people, uh, people that love climbing as much as you do. Uh, and then, of course, you can support this show on Patreon at the link below as well. So my special thanks go to Pete for joining us as our guest this week. My thanks, as always, to John, and my thanks to you for watching. We will see you very soon in the next one. Have a good one.